Woe be unto him who opens one of the seven gateways to hell, because through that gateway, evil will invade the world. I'm here with Duncan McLeish. He runs a podcast network, uh, pretty much a one-man army here. How many shows do you have on that show, uh, channel now or network? Um, there is four, technically. There is the fifth one, but the fifth one is so inconsistent in its releases that I don't officially count it. It's like a small... It's like, <laughs> it's like finding out you've got cancer. It's a surprise when it happens, um, and not always a welcome one. So. Oh. <laughs> yeah, um, how many episodes are you up to now? Over like 600, 700? Um, on Podcast Under the Stairs, I'm up over... I'm almost at 1,300. So. I knew it was some ridiculous number. <laughs> I couldn't remember. Like after yeah. like 500, it's like... Yeah, it's just it's, a million. It's like I, I kind of... I was publicizing it a lot for a while as we were getting towards the 1,000 mark, but I was like, I think I might be... I think I might be the only podcast in the world 
in the horror genre that has a thousand episodes and at that point I just stopped counting after that. Oh, there yeah. are plenty of other ones that I think have achieved that, but their names have changed or they went through, you know, they kind of restarted what they've done or whatnot. But in terms of just 10 years, about 1,300 um, episodes. <laughs> so. I, I have to be one of the longest running YouTube reviewers, I'll tell you that. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's got to be over six, 15, 16 years. A lot of, a lot of crap. Yes. <laughs> a lot of crap up there like watching old videos it's like so um uh 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 guys it's <laughs> like my hair out of my face but uh <laughs> that's why i love podcasts like i can't go back like no one could jump because i've recently started doing youtube stuff and i cringe when i see my i cringe when i hear my voice during editing i cringe even more when i see my face while i'm reviewing and the thought of being able to see myself 10 years ago I'm like, uh. <laughs> it's also depressing too because you just watch yourself like Age. turn to that old man from Saving Private Ryan when he goes, "Fucking Christ!" It's like you're like, <laughs> oh, I love it. Oh, I absolutely love it. Uh, um, so so yeah, we're here. So, oh, yeah, we're here Go to talk it. about 1981 Andrei Zulowski's Possession, which is more of an art film but 100% a horror film at the same time. The director had dabbled into different genres. Um, he made a couple other horror films, which I've, I've never actually watched. Devil, I think. Um, mm -hmm. And there's another one, I think, that would be considered horror. Um, not Silver Glow, but The uh, th Third Night or something around that. Yeah, yeah. Well, none of them are like out-and-out -out horror movies, so. Yeah, so I just know that he's a pretty infamous director, and this movie has a pretty infamous following. It's a, it's a really bizarre one for 81. Um, shot in, what, West Germany at the time? Yeah. Or was it, yeah. And uh, you see the Berlin Wall in the background of the entire film, which is a perfect setting for this movie. It stars two legendary kind of actors, uh, Isabella Johnny and Sam Neill, in some of the most intense performances of all time. Um, I don't think there's much acting going there. It works as a brilliant divorce film, also an end of the world film, uh, a precursor to Hellraiser, uh, a period <laughs> at the end of The Brood. It works as all these sound things. It's it's a weird ass movie. It's not for everybody. Duncan was on the cruising episode with me for 1980, so mm -hmm. we're gonna dive into possession. It's I've I've seen this movie for years, a few times, and it gets better every time I watch it. How do you feel about the movie? Uh, yeah, it's one of those ones where it's like a life experience movie. You know, I mean, the older you get, I think the more you mine from it. Um, well, the first time I watched it, I was in my twenties. And it just, it was angsty and angry and shouty. And to be honest, that's kind of how I felt in my twenties. So I gravitated towards that. You know, it was the idea of almost a, a kind of director rebelling against the, the, the kind of the, the cinematic norms. And I looked at it from that point of view, paid very little att attention actually to the subtext of the story. Um, in my thirties, I looked more upon it as someone that had been through a couple of relationships and um, could, you know, could see that side of how um how messy things can get on that level in my 40s now um i actually look at it very much about just how insecure people actually are um overall the the insecurities that seep into our life the the way we can allow our imaginations to run wild to extremes to the points even beyond what makes sense or are the norms you know like what is possible um, and I I find that like it's most fascinating quality. Now I think it captures that. It's, it's about the best breakup movie um, in terms of capturing the extreme versions of what you go through in terms of roller coasters as um, a movie like Blue is the Warmest Color, which is like this French kind of art house drama movie, which is incredible as well. And it's both those movies are like licking a battery um, in terms of how like jarring they are in terms of like really getting on the nerve of what it feels like to lose someone that you are in love with because they are in love with someone else yeah that oh. is probably one of the worst feelings ever i imagine yeah. like yeah. Ed, or the idea to separate from someone that you still love mm -hmm. is is horrible for yeah. other circumstances uh, this this movie opens up and you notice the camera never stops moving. It's almost yeah. like it's it's like a voyeur, but it's not like a tracking. It'll constantly move. And it's mm -hmm. just the music comes in and it just sets the mood. And yeah. the first thing I noticed about this movie is it's 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 almost drained of color in a, 
in a clinical way, which I usually hate. I can't stand it, but it's also naturalistic looking. And this is just mm -hmm. how I imagine that this place looked a hundred percent, the architecture, everything like that. Um, now, which is funny because uh, Suspiria uh, actually <laughs> is, is in that West Germany and the, the Berlin wall is there and yeah. they don't really, they don't work too much with it, but the remake does. And I think yes. the remake looks kind of like this in a, in a little bit. I just imagine that this is how it looks. So I love natural naturalistic lighting. I hate when the colors drain, but these work so well together. I think it's one of the most beautiful looking movies. And when you mm -hmm. have that dark contrast, the blood with the dark white and blue, it oh, just yeah. stands out really, really harshly. And it just, I don't know, it just, it hits a little different than just blood on a wall, you know? Yeah, also like it plays into like the prominence of when color is actually used, um, specifically in the kind of replica characters that come out later on in the eye color. Yeah, um, eye color. If if the movie had a more vibrant palette, those would not stand out nearly as much as they do. Um, and also, you get like I think you're like of the era, it captures that kind of like Germ West Germany in particular has this has this connotation so does east germany to an extent of that kind of industrial vibe so things are all kind of grays and whites and you know that's just a, is that a kind of very sterile lacking emotion and, and this director as well is from you know the eastern blockade so all that kind of fits into to the palette but it's like you see when you get those colors like particularly blood in this one the they stand out so much more they have more of an impact to the viewer visually there's something that connects you in there and that's just smart filmmaking it is very pretentious and there's no getting around that but it works for the subject matter it works for the movie um and sam neil anyway sam neil is a pale person in fact both these lead actors and uh, actresses very here are very pale people so it kind of even works further more on that it's kind of like he's kind of <clears throat> dulling the environment to match their kind of their features as well as a way to make sure nothing is too overpowering because the performance is overpowering. You've got enough of that. You've got enough in the dialogue and the performance that if you then start throwing garish colors, Argento was like this, for example, it would be all over the place. So I don't think it, it works if Argento yeah. lights this. Yeah. Doesn't need it. Doesn't need that at all. No, uh, th this movie is, is super bizarre. And like, it's the only one that really fits the, from the year. The only movie that's even comparable is kind of a, a, a drama that's really dark that dips into the horror genre. No Mercy, No Future. Have you watched that one? I've never seen that. No. It's really disturbing. It looks kind of like this. It's kind of just like one of those, like, a couple days in the life of a mentally ill person that mm. goes around. It almost seems like post-apocalyptic, but it's not. And she just has these sexual escapades and just mental breakdowns and run-ins with people. It's some really awful stuff honestly yeah. and, and and it's it's a really good movie and it's the only one that i've witnessed from this year that shows that has any dna with it and i don't know i think that it has some of the same like cinematography style and geographical like looks to it mm -hmm. but besides that i can't really think of many movies made around this time that looked exactly like this except horror movies in particular not not yeah. really any horror films at all i mean i i feel like when you watch like a uh, the fast finder movies a couple of those that i saw have some of that like yeah. uh what is this the one i can't think of it um with the uh african-american the arab guy and he dates yep. the old woman that one mm -hmm. i think has that depression look that's a german film too isn't it germany yes yeah that's germany yeah there's a there's a like, i mean it's weird like germany like G german cinema from this time just has that it has that feel, which is why, like you, like kind of pointed out, and and rightly so. That's why Suspiria never feels like, like the original Suspiria never feels like it's shot in Germany. Like no. when they're like that, oh, it's a it's a dancing school in West Germany. You're looking at it going that, no, no. no. <laughs> West Germany is angst. That's West Germany, right? Like yeah, angst like, looks yeah. just like this movie. Angst and this yeah. are the same, and and they're both just 100%. for some reason bleh, yes. make you want to throw up in a way. Like you feel immediately trapped. Yes, but like that's but like because the people are on the, they, they like they are right against the wall of war. They're they're on the frontiers of the Cold War. So there's part of that that just seeps into everything. Like that is culture. That you know. So it, like it never it never made sense. I think it, there's also like a really interesting idea here about what like who Sam Neill actually is as a character here. So his occupation is a spy. Yeah, he's right. an assassin spy for sure. They never get into details, but no doubt. Yeah. The way he handles certain things that happen with 
without much panic with yeah. like glee at times yes yeah. oh and, yeah and that's what he's more on hinge though yeah and you see him like like has it is it like the, the, the kind of the, the interesting thing about this one is like for a guy that is so in control of essentially what he does for a living his time spent doing that has meant that all the telltale signs that he would have had about his wife um are not there he has a very a very narrow very generalized almost like a, a kind of norman rockwell idea of what a woman at home should be. She looks after the kids. She keeps the house tidy. She loves her husband when her husband comes home, but she doesn't have a life. Um, and she's kind of not allowed to have that life. Um, and it comes even down to, like, very early on, like, right at the start, like, as soon as he has this feeling that there might be something going on, he starts looking at the books on the wall in the library at their home, and he starts to see that there's there's more kind of worldly reading that she shouldn't be reading. She shouldn't... Um, she shouldn't Philosophical stuff. Yeah. You know, yeah. She shouldn't know Bohemian these authors. lifestyles, weird shit yeah. like that. He's a man of the world. She should be a, ma- a woman at home. Yes, a hundred percent. And um, as a result of that, kind of she kind of blindsides him because he never at any point thinks that this is even a possibility, which I think speaks to the, the focus of the character on his work and not on his family life. Um, it also like, adds to the way he is completely ill-equipped eloqu- well, is an understatement for how he handles like the facts about her just not actually loving him anymore. <laughs> like the fact that she doesn't like might not love him anymore is is such an affront to him. Um it kind of breaks his brain for the first part of the movie. And then when he kind of tries to piece it together, he pieces it together wrong. It's like trying to put the wrong jigsaw bits. Yeah. Like and that, that'll do. It kind of looks like a forest. I don't know. Um you know what I mean it's just it's all wrong. He tries to talk out loud to himself to work it through and maybe she will hear him and he's just rambling. He's like, well, maybe if I understood that you loved her and this, you loved him and this could work and maybe what do you want? He doesn't understand emotion. He doesn't doesn't understand compassion. He's very emotionally immature. He's very good at everything else. Yeah. But I mean, if somebody's really good at something else, they're going to be lacking somewhere else. Yeah, he's, he's, ask, he's clearly, yeah. he's got all the tools that he needs to be very good at the job that he does. But those tools don't always make... Well, there's a reason James Bond was never in a long-term relationship with anyone. <laughs> like Because well, that's there's because nothing he behind the eyes there. You know what I mean? He's, he's like, he's an emotionalist. He's, he's a machine, pretty nothing much. Nothing underneath. So, yeah, pretty much. There, there is no James Bond. And Sam Neill is kind of like that, but he's the kind of Cold War equivalent here um, of a guy who can smile and hold a conversation, but you can't get close to him because there is no Sam Neill in this well, movie. You've been in a bar, right? Yeah. And you've talked to lots of people. Uh-huh. And they're great <laughs> until you go, ah, how are you doing? What do you think it is? Nothing yeah. underneath. Yeah. <laughs> Nothing underneath. And you're just like, I don't want to be here anymore. You know, like you don't want to make plans outside the bar with them, and you just gotta not go to the bar anymore unless you're going with friends. Yeah, it's like, like I've um, like I used to joke that um, I never did the in the in the UK. I know they do some of the things in America. They'll probably call them something slightly different, but the the kind of the lads' holiday, where you and a group of your friends who are eighteen or nineteen all go on holiday together to like essentially sow your wild oats and all the rest like that. I never did that with any of my friends. Um, and I always used to get oh, well, you're a bit of a prude or whatnot. Like, why, why didn't you do that? And I was like, I can hand, I could handle my friends I grew up with that I had nothing in common with other than proximity. Um, yeah. I could handle spending like a day with them. I could handle like like um, like going to a bar with them or whatever. The idea of being in a remote location <laughs> with them for a week, I couldn't do it because after I know after a day I would have run out of things to say and it would just be awkward and horrible. Um and that's kind of like it's the the introduction of the Heinrich character who we get very quick in this one as uh, essentially the one that she's stepping out with. He's oh, great. Yeah. He's such a good character and actor. He's so But weird. he's the other he's the other side of Sam Neill. So he is all in touch with his feelings. He's very artistic. He's he's the, the he's the exact if if Sam Neill is one side of the coin, Heinrich is the other side but of the coin they're also both sides of toxic masculinity because 100% Henry, as well <laughs> and she's toxic as well she's horribly toxic and yeah. the first part of this movie i think that you side with sam neil because he comes yes. in and he's so lost you're like she is so awful and then mm-hmm. as it goes on you're like 
I think he may be worse. And then yeah. as it goes on, you're like, they're both terrible and they belong together and they belong dead. <laughs> and it just kind of ends there. But I, this is the first time I registered how manipulative Heinrich was with the drugs. Oh, yes, and, yeah. And you're just like, oh, he's Charles Manson. Yeah, he, like when he, like, so early on, we find that a postcard from the Taj Mahal because he's worldly. Um, he never even saying, went there, I bet. He just he fucking funny. got the postcard. <laughs> His mom sent it to him and he's like, right. <laughs> <laughs> well, basically, uh, Sam Neill, because he's a spy, very easily tracks this guy down oh. um, and confronts him at his home. And this guy is practically dancing as he talks. It's very kind of he's like he's he's like opening. He's he's pract- he's exposing his chest. Him. He's like we need. He to, always has his chest open. The chest is always right there, and he's, he's like, exposing to- his heart. <laughs> yeah, we need to get like we need to have contact here. We need to understand what our dynamic is. There's no is. need we... to haste me. <laughs> <laughs> it's the, there's no need to haste me. Um, it does kind of remind me a little bit of um, well, he's a kind of he's, he's kind of he's got a bit of the you do care about him, yeah, a little bit which, more serious though, yeah, like, like which I kind of love about him. Uh, but he does it like it has this whole like Ian Hall, you know, Ian Hall meets Udai here. That's it. It's the Brundlefly version of that. Like the, the two of them are being crushed together, and what we get is this. And he's, you're right. He's a spectacular character because he just doesn't. At no point does he feel like a real person, but people like this exist. So, oh yeah, you met this you know guy. I mean? Um, but he is like, you know, like, I can give her something you haven't. Um, he even asked the question. He's golden him into starting a fight as well. It doesn't like I picked up on it more this time. The fact that he says, "Can you tell me?" Um, when you had sex with her last time, what was it like? Because we had sex after it and it was the best sex ever. So I can only assume it was bad sex that she had with you. And then she, like, he's like golden. And then ultimately Sam Neill decides he's going to, is going to have a little fist fight with him. And it doesn't work out well. No, because this, this guy is tough as shit, actually. <laughs> and I love that he, he, he feels bad because he's not a violent guy. No, he, he's not, that, that German guy's not really violent. Yeah. So like he's a he's like a pacifist. He's like one of those guys that says the meanest shit to you and then does, never expects to get in a fight, but he knows how to yeah. defend himself. So he like he picks him up to help him, and Sam Neil just starts trying to strangle him, and he just hits him again. He's like, I had left him no choice. He didn't seem like he wanted to hit him again, though. Honestly, oh, he's he'd already proved like there there is that thing where you know you, you see it in movies a lot, but well, you see it in real life as well when someone says stay down, and the yeah. reason they're telling you to stay down is they because they you. know. Yeah, this, like I've 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 shown you a little of what I can do. And like if if this keeps going, this is not this is going to end up very 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 bad for I, you. I, and I, he doesn't I, doesn't want to do it. <laughs> uh, this this is an unrelated kind of funny story, but I don't want to say who it was. But a close family member of mine said he was in this traffic jam, <laughs> and like he was just like, "There's somebody trying to merge on the expressway." And he was like, "Yeah." He let him over, and he looks over, and this middle aged man is like fifty, just like cussing a storm out, "You motherfucking piece of shit!" Like that cussing him, and and my brother. Oop, well, yes. <laughs> he's like, shut your goddamn mouth. Like he can read his lips and the guy got, he saw him and he just got so mad. He got out of his car and my brother was like, all right. So my brother's like, like six, four and a half, real lanky. He just hip tossed the guy in the ground and he fell and he's like, stay the fuck down. And got in his car and just sat down. The old guy was like, it's so nice to see an old guy get put in his place for being a dickhead. <laughs> he didn't do that. He just hit tossed him and threw him. He's like, stay the fuck down. Yeah, it's st- like that. This is over, right? <laughs> like, Why'd like... you even do get out of your car? <laughs> <laughs> it was fine when we were shouting at each other. Uh, the, the other thing is, like, ultimately, Heinrich, because and you mentioned that he's just as equally toxic. He's just, he's, he's like that right. version of toxic and masculinity. He gets, he gets fragile too. He is so fragile because ultimately, um, she steps out in him as well. And when she does that, he cannot handle, he can't he cannot process why this would happen. And we, we get that great interaction of basically him showing up at Sam Neil's house very much the same way that Sam Neil showed up at and his he's like, house. Oh, he's like stumbling around. Yeah. <laughs> he's like full dancing as he's talking and down the stairs. And Sam Neil at that point, you're right, by that point it's kind of he him. sees yeah, but he is like he is in glee. He's in he's getting back at him. them. Yeah, and he's he's not a good person. No, no. <laughs> but he's it's also not... completely unhinged at that time. Yeah, he is. He's like the because we the, the movie plays with the like, and you mentioned it before. Very much like the Brood. This is a director who is going through the most horrible breakup and has decided to use 
the only medium he can to relate that experience the medium of film which lasts forever um and this is him kind of getting all those demons out and uh and his kind of artistic form david cronenberg approached it differently david cronenberg actually approached that uh, uh, the idea of like the visible boils on the skin being yeah. that of trauma like uh, the visualization of it and this one here is much more psychological and cerebral which feels weird to say <laughs> that this movie is over a cronenberg movie which usually gets the same things yeah and this one is actually he's went one step further and it's this manifestation of how we perceive people's intentions their actions as being almost alien to yourself like the, the the reason that she would not love me anymore is because she is no longer herself um and that goes to very extreme levels here it, like some would say even I, I, lovecraft is a terrible comparison but like the, the, there's tentacles in this movie right it's the bit that everyone usually when someone talks about yeah. possession it's usually the first thing that springs to mind. It's, I don't always go there. I always go with the, it's a movie that just makes me feel cold and uncomfortable yeah. for almost its and entire depressed. run. And depressed. 100%. You cannot, be, you cannot come out this movie singing, you know, like songs from the sound of music. Like no. um, another German film. Uh, like, well, I think it's Austrian. But like, you, you, can't, you can't feel that way. It's designed... That way you mentioned it before. Even the ending of this movie, you're kind of with the police on this one. Like, like, like someone has to die. Um, yeah. Please make someone die. Um, but it's the the way he structures it is that whenever you get a lull of potential happiness for either character, what comes after is like the next level of mania. So you never, you're uneasy all the way throughout this movie because you're switching allegiances, but you're also getting moments where you can kind of see what a Sam Neill relationship where he's actually trying kind of looks like, and it looks okay. And then yeah. you see how he interacts with people at, uh, like, during that time, and you're like, oh, this is all an act. This is never how you are in the relationship because this is how you're treating other people. And that's probably the real you. ever had time to have a relationship with yeah. anyone i think he's always i mean he's been in war probably this entire time yep so i don't think they've ever actually spent much time together i think they probably yeah. had the kid and he moved away and also the kid here is a is a crazy factor to have that child oh, yeah. like and you see sam neil try to punish her through the kid early on yeah. i don't want to be involved with the kid anymore that's just to hurt her a hundred percent. Yeah. And you've seen people do that or in other ways in relationships or breakups or, or when you're trying to get somebody back or vice versa. And they do do stuff like that, you know? Yeah. Because ultimately <laughs> like you, like you can do whatever you want to another person, right? But, and you can handle it. You can control how you can yeah. feel about that. You cannot control how you feel about your children. That is like, it's ingrained, it's locked in. It's just, that's, that's there. So the the fact that he uses that as a weapon, she ultimately uses that as a weapon later on by essentially neglecting and walking out on. You yeah. know what I mean? Like he's your, I, I, I will show up, and when I show up, I'm the the happy mother that laughs at all his his jokes and all his stories, and I'm very dutiful and all the rest. And then there's that scene where like she's sitting in the kitchen and the kids like telling stories and she's laughing, and Sammy walks in, and the look she gives them would fucking freeze blood is that cold and then she starts laughing at the kids joke again and it's it's kind of like is she is she just like trying to to do the same thing and like they both become Monsters. horribly malicious yeah malicious worse than the cover. actual monster in the movie yeah the monster in the movie is just the monster you know what i mean uh it's just well, trying to do its thing and uh, the monster in the movie is bizarre because it's it's almost plays into another movie that Sam Neill wasn't this year, the final conflict, the Omen three. And yeah. you can assume that that monster is constantly through the, the people it's feeding it or through the sex is manifesting into another version of Sam Neill, a doppelganger, yes. an antichrist that brings the end of the world because we have the sirens go off, but it's also on the Berlin wall. So you can expect war anytime. Yeah. It's such a bizarre, weird way, and I'm not sure how to interpret it the ending a hundred percent. You know what I mean? No, I've I've I, I read I remember the, the last time I watched it, I thought I would go 
like spend like a couple of weeks watching like YouTube breakdowns, like read like articles, like proper like full on analysis. And what I realized is no one really has a grip on it at all, which is kind of great. I, like I think the 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 best kind of art house movies are the ones that what you bring to it is essentially what you take away from it. Um, and in the case of this one, it's it's kind of even moreover a bizarre one in that essentially the director never really went into too much detail in interviews. Sam Neill will not talk about this movie. Um, oh, we we figured there, that's from Isabella Johnny. Just yeah. not a good time. Yeah. She, she um, even after death, her death, Sam Neill is still kind of like... She's still I'm, alive. He wouldn't talk about it after. she after she passed away? Uh, no, was he, he, sorry. He passed away. And I think that the assumption was that when she died, he might... One of them might say, I don't think they ever will. And to be honest, I don't think I want to hear about it. No, I just think I, that they were probably both method acting and it got real ugly. Yeah, yeah. Is the, and also, I, I feel there's a there's a part of... There are certain movies where you can feel like a weird chemistry that actually aids the movie. Another one that springs to mind is Don't Look Now, um, where, you know, Donald Sutherland himself, like there was all those rumours for years, yeah. like they fucked on set and people filmed it and that's why that scene is like raw and like animalistic and bizarrely passionate and like that's just that happened and you i don't think we will ever know like one way or another fully about that one nor do i need to i'm so engaged by the performance it feels so real to me their performance that I kind of get lost in it that I want yeah. to think there's something beyond it i feel the, their performances are so so intense all the way through this movie that there's no way that I can disassociate myself from, oh, well, they're acting. You know, like, so there must be something behind that. Um, Because it it feels like every conversation is so charged and I can't imagine making a movie. like, Like, I felt exhausted when I finished watching it. Could you imagine how exhausted you would feel filming this i i've made movies before and mm. i've been on low budget movies with lack of sleep and a lot of physical stunts and stuff but i don't the physical physicality that these two are doing the the acting sick the shaking the screaming yeah. the, the having these physical breakdowns the sex scenes with the monster it's yeah. just had to be one of the hardest shoots you can imagine physically mentally emotionally um as far as the ending is concerned you could take it at face value that says that the end of a love or relationship is basically the end of the world. Yep. You could say that after you come through after a relationship, you are afraid of what you'll be. Mm-hmm. Uh, Sam Neill will be cold and dark because if you've ever broken someone's heart that you feel has never had their heart broken, you feel like you take their innocence. And that's yes. the worst thing you can do, I think, mm-hmm. because everybody knows their first heartbreak and the first love they had is something so different that you feel yeah. so alive and nothing's ever going to be this good and nothing's ever going to feel this bad and then when you get it broke you have a lot of insecurity and you have that moment where you're like oh wow i just had my heart broken for the first time and you come out of it but doing that to someone makes them a little less happy a little bit less pleasant and you don't want to be the person that does that to someone so you're 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 worried how everybody's going to turn out after the situation you know yeah, it links back to something we were talking about just like just before we started recording. Um, we were catching up, and it's that that idea of kind of realizing the world isn't an idyllic way that you think it is. Like it's kind of like it's like like kind of having your heart broken is kind of realizing that the world is a real place. Yeah. Um, weirdly, I, I like it, I, I'm not saying that everyone that's ever had their heart broken has kind of felt like colossally changed after it but most people have it does kind of a contextual i'd like all right like there's a, a small part that no longer trusts everyone on the level there was before there's yeah. now a voice in the back of your head that will maybe question or doubt things that in the past you were supremely confident or never gave a second thought um and yeah as it, it, it becomes that way i i'm more in line with you that i feel like the, the end of this movie with it with the sirens going off is basically the the kind of like once once you finally consign yourself to the fact that this relationship is dead the world that you had that that view of the world or that kind of experience you had is over so it might as well be the end of the world and the birth of a new so 
Yeah, I, I'm kind of on par with that as well. It gets it gets so the movie gets so bizarre though. It is like obviously the the technical scene is what people talk about. The I, I think that the scene that probably haunts me more than any scene in this one is and it must be something to do with underpasses because um, <laughs> Gaspar Noe yeah. like creates a, another incredibly horrible about the same length scene in his movie but she has what she classes as a miscarriage and the yeah and but it's all foam and blood and it's her on her knees screaming um for like moments and moments and moments as blood drips down her face and fluid like comes out from i have a t-shirt of that i should have probably worn it (laughs) i mean it's an iconic shot it's got to be one of the most memorable scenes of the year oh yeah um and i i just I don't understand how the monster works because it seems that she's bringing people to this monster somewhat. Mm-hmm. Every it does the monster doesn't necessarily feed on them, but it feeds on the sex and becomes more and more Sam Neil as she does. Yeah. But if the monster impregnated her, what was it impregnating her with? The the yeah. Sam Neil, and then she had an abortion, but she has sex again. So is that monster turning to Sam Neil, or is it actually becoming birthed? Yeah. So. Who's to say? But I know the scene when the first guy goes in, who's eating the 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 sausage. He's from uh, yep. Clockwork Orange. <laughs> yes, that's yes, right. Yes, <laughs> yes. That the fucking perverted guy. He's gr- great cast, and uh, he ends up biting it really bad. And his his whole thing is great when he's she's like Isaac. I don't understand. I bet she thinks he's coming on to him, and uh, and this the bathroom. I have to check the bathroom. <laughs> that whole scene is just really crazy. Let me let me plug this in. You can keep talking. I, I yep. just I can hear you. I just think it might be running on batteries. I never use these. Cool, no problem. Yeah, um, yeah I think um the like the casting's really smart. I think um like you mentioned before, I think what we get in terms of um the like the set design, the, the, the you know, the, the performances are all great. I think the score plays a huge part in this as well. Like I, I genuinely think that the score of the movie is one of those things that drives it all the way through. It kind of has weirdly a uh, kind of almost like giallo esque score that sits over the top of it, which is full of color and 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 a movie which it doesn't have any color. Um, it's like could have went with a like a, a kind of almost brooding kind of post industrial dirge all the way through this movie and it would have fitted the, the you know the aesthetics and the performances but the fact is is something a little bit more as it has color to it and so, like a darker color but as this color to it it kind of works against the performances very over the top it's um, playful it's a playful score and the movie yeah. is the camera works playful the score is playful very yeah. clinical and well done but like i don't want to just call it clinical but I just think the cinematography is just really excellent and moving constantly. It doesn't stand yes, still. Yes, it's kinetics, constant movement in the camera, which makes you feel uneasy as well. You never get that static shot where you can rest as a viewer. It's always, even when they're in the room and they're talking, the camera is moving, like following someone around, capturing something. Like it's constant. There's constant movement in it, which I think is just a technique where it clearly is a conscious technique. Like there's oh, yeah. no way he accidentally did that. So that's a, that's a stylistic choice against the performances. There's a couple of great scenes as well. It reminded me of um, the Nicholas Cage scene in Mandy, where he's in the bathroom um, after she dies. He gets the bottle of vodka out. Yeah. He starts drinking the vodka, and there's a bit where they've clearly said to Cage, "Your wife's just died. She's been burned in front of you. Go." And you see him revving himself up and he gets to a point where he actually moves and you see the camera jump back as if the cameraman did not expect that movement. And that happens about two or three times in this where they're like the clearly we're, we're, we're kind of vibing off the energy and you weren't supposed to come that close or that wasn't supposed to happen. So I now have to move. And that realization and movement makes you feel like you're in the room with them. It, yeah. it, it, it brings you into it, there is nothing more uncomfortable in this world nothing more uncomfortable in this world than um, being out with friends that are in a relationship and seeing them argue in front of you and you just you don't know if you should excuse yourself or is there a way to stop this or what's going to happen um, make a joke, how- try to lighten it or just be like yeah, <laughs> should I crack a joke? 
Because <laughs> like one of them you're probably very close to, and the other like you're you're friendly with because it's like yeah. your best friend's wife or something or husband, and you're just like I, they're just I looking at your other friends like they, they do it in a <laughs> kill list and kill list they have that great scene at the beginning where. <laughs> Like the, there's this horrible argument, and as the viewer, you just feel so uncomfortable. In this movie, all their interactions, where the camera's moving and all the rest, you feel like you're in the room with them. So as a result, that's one of the, the unsettling things about it, is you're seeing what couples have or keep behind closed doors. Which Embarrassingly really... toxic behavior, too. Yeah. Like childish. Yes. Yeah. And you're doing it for entertainment as well as the viewer. You're being vo you mentioned voyeuristic. You're be you are voyeuristically watching this toxic behavior unfold, and it just it continually adds up. And it's very smart. It's 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 very easy. I see like reviewers and people critics to an extent say, "Oh, well, it's very Lynchian," and I, I I think that's an easy thing to see when not I don't taking think it, it is. context. It's, it's not, when you take into context, the only movie Lynch had made which was considered quote-unquote art house by this point is a Razorhead, which is a completely different movie to this. Like, well, completely different movie to this. Yeah, the not stuff a like that kind of the, the stuff that kind of then dabbles a bit more in kind of colour scheme or weird avant-garde performances like a Dennis Hopper in Blue Velvet don't come until five, six years after this Blue movie. Blue Velvet and this don't have any DNA. No, no, no! Like, like, like the only thing, the only thing you could see is, um, I, like an over, -top, over the top, yeah, it's over the top screaming performance, is is about as close to this. But you see these people trying to instead of saying this movie is actually remarkable in doing what it does at the time that it does it, like you mentioned before, or like coming out in eighty one, and remarking on that, people like try and grab onto things around them as comparisons, and I actually think. It works so much better without those comparisons in place. You can well, see DNA of other filmmakers around, surely. I, but I like it's kind of I like its singular vision of this is this is an experience I need to get out. The best filmmakers like direct from the heart, and this guy's like I have an experience I need to get out. This is how I'm going to do it, and this is the medium in which I'm going to try and make it. It might not all make sense. It might not all hang together. Doesn't my brain? Because this is how I feel, and feelings are not rational, they're not logical, and they're hard to explain. And through this visual medium, I'm going to try and give you a glimpse of what I felt going through this experience visually. And that's, you know, it doesn't need to make sense. That like, you don't need to know what the ending is. You don't need to like you can grasp on those things if you want to try and bring it together. But it's experience cinema. You get to the end of this one, and the experience you went through is draining and tiring, and that's the effect because breaking up with someone. Um, or being in a relationship which is loveless, or being in a contentious, toxic religious uh, relationship, is draining. And like it, 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 it will, it carries over you like a it weight. Can it's like make you physically sick. It can yeah. take life away from you. It can mm -hmm. age you. It can do all sorts of things to you. Yeah. And you can, you can, similar to the brood, you can develop manifestations in your body. Hundred like, percent. Um. Honestly, uh, the thing is, like I said, that if I had to compare this to certain movies, I think Fastbinder movies I've seen produce and yeah. stuff similar, like Tenderness of the Wolves. Is that 76 or was yeah, that later? That's, yeah, it's kind of late 70s, yeah. Yeah, I think that is in there. I think Angst was inspired by this a bit, probably that mm -hmm. I look, but that's just be the geographical location. I think Hellraiser took. Hellraiser, 100%. 100%. Yeah. Um, but but I also think The Brood, it lifted from The mm -hmm. Brood a bit. And I also think that Cemetery Man took from this film. Yes. Yes, I hadn't even, you know, I hadn't even put that together. And the playful doppelgangers, the misfortunes of love, the, yeah. the the toxic kind of, all that stuff. And I do think that you're kind of trapped in your circumstance. There's a lot of stuff in there. Like, and yeah. those movies I think are all excellent films. So it's kind of something that just spoke to me. And I, I, the more I watch it, the more I see the trajectory of what it came from and what it's inspired. Now, if we're yeah. looking at 81, like... There's movies that went ahead and influenced the horror genre immediately after, like Evil. Oh yeah, Evil, Evil Dead. Dead. I mean, like Evil. There's, there's like, I think we, we like, too many people blase when it comes to to how influential Evil Dead is, especially like, you know, in like, the initial blast of it when it was released. It was everywhere. Yeah, it's but, another movie that made the nasty list as well, where yeah. like <laughs> made the nasty list, and Sam Raimi basically went over, went to court 
for it. Yeah. And they were like, okay, fine. It's okay. <laughs> it's, it's, sorry, Sam Raimi. <laughs> the best movies are on the nasty list or the worst movies? Oh, yeah. Oh, well, <laughs> it's like, yeah. It's tough. <laughs> there's like there's no in between there's no like you know what that's a that's that's a that's a perfectly fine movie it's You're like, either utter garbage or instant classic cannibal holocaust yeah cannibal tear <laughs> cannibal holocaust cannibal tear <laughs> like right <laughs> dude you've no idea and they, they, they just keep they like it's it's such a bizarre thing this is such a bizarre movie to put on a video nasties list like because it clearly is it's clearly an artistic it's an art horror movie like which it, in the uk for some reason was usually given carte blanche you know what i mean they, they didn't they didn't crack down as heavy on those sort of thing also it's a long movie for the nasties list a lot yeah. of a lot of what happened um with video nasties were never full screenings of movies it would generally be if something really fucked up happened in the first 10 minutes Chances are it was going on the nasties list, and if you know stuff was relatively light, um, it would be okay. So it feels like a very strange addition. self harm. Now, I've noticed they really do not yeah. like self harm in the mm -hmm. UK, um, yeah. and there's plenty of self harm in here from Sam Neill and Ajani and the suicides at the end. Yep, yeah, yeah, they yeah. both kill you, themselves. Well, You've got people. You've got people, like, people in this movie specifically taking uh, electric knives to their skin, um, which yeah, probably wouldn't. Uh, I, that part like, is that, a little that, bit comical, yes. only because he wraps Isabella Johnny up and then he cuts himself to see if she does the same for him, and she just leaves. She leaves. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's fucking great, man. It's so fucking great. Um, but yeah, I think there's 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 a lot. Like I say, it's a, it's, it's a weird one in there, but it's it's. When you look back at it now, it's interesting because it has this groundswell behind it now of people that are really championing it. But for the longest time, this is a movie that languished in relative obscurity. Like yeah. it had, it had people who were really, really passionate about, it, but they were very, very small. Uh, and I think that a lot is to do with access to the movie. We can obviously you can now buy it on 4K UHD. Um, for the longest time, there weren't. It wasn't like a widely publicly available movie and it was but, cut when it was initially yeah. released in a lot of territories and united states was cut. cut didn't make any fucking sense i guess yeah <laughs> i'm so glad to put that things in there and it's, it totally makes sense um, it, it makes a lot more sense is my understanding 100% makes more sense now but like there's a you know it's one of those movies that through sheer force of will and word of mouth um has slowly found itself becoming a bit more important it makes a lot more lists now than it would have even seven or eight years ago well, um i was gonna cool. say yeah for sure for sure and it's it's well deserved now i was gonna say about evil dead is the initial release of evil dead inspired filmmakers who loved horror and who didn't love horror who wanted to make money to release yeah. films something like possession nobody sees possession and says i can make a quick buck making a movie like possession <laughs> <laughs> so real filmmakers see possession like Gaspar Noe and you yeah. know those kind of people and they're like oh wow that that I think that has a genuinely lasting influence on many art filmmakers that go on to create further masterpieces yeah. how many ripoffs of evil dead are considered masterpieces this is true this is true this and is I'm not true. saying that one's better than the other evil dead Texas Chainsaw Night of the Living Dead those movies have are probably like the three American classics that have such a regional classics have such an impact on horror it cannot yeah. be it's understated at all i mean those are like yeah, the rosetta big... stones for yeah. whole genres of yeah. filmmakers you know what i mean i think and you're right to an extent it, it, it's the it's almost on some level if you imagine if possession was made today a24 would put it out um it wouldn't be nearly as daring as this the closest that i've got to feeling interestingly enough um and this is, it came to me last night when I was watching this. I was, I was kind of, I really liked, I know a lot of people didn't like, uh, but I really liked the new Ari Aster movie. Um, I didn't watch it yet. Uh, Bo was afraid. I, I really liked it, but it's, it's like a psychological, like exploration of anxiety. It really, it just is, I, I like, I felt horribly anxious when I came out of the cinema from watching it. And <laughs> in a world where possession, and other filmmakers like Bergman, for example, aren't out there making movies that are just like, well, like, like the distillation of a feeling in cinema. 
like you know, but being able to capture a entire feeling and put that as the like that is the narrative. You just get that as the viewer. Um, I don't think people like Ari Aster, like, are inspired to make movies like Hereditary, which you know has that kind of just that overwhelming claustrophobic feel, or Midsummer, which kind of has this. Yeah. Even more bizarre, kind of like you like their experience. It's what I class as experience pieces. You come out feeling like you've been through an experience, and then you want to discuss the movie and try and work out how it made you feel the way it made you feel. A, a, a lot of this links back to Possession's a great art type of it. It's certainly not the first movie that did it, but no. it's one of those ones. I think in '81, people were just not equipped to handle this, like like yeah. at all. And as a result, there probably was a slight few. Um, who watched the movie and, and you know, spoke to them. They were maybe going through a similar experience or could relate to certain characters or could see it for the view it was. The fact that our audience now, as dumb as cinema goers are in a lot of respects, there's a lot of people that have a timeline of filmmakers to get into. And once they've experienced, you know, like, uh, like a John Carpenter, for example, they then have a list of other filmmakers that they can go and check out. You can almost build up your kind of filmic knowledge by following through on these things. Yeah. It's the same in Art House. I think you watch certain movies which open the doorway to certain movies and it works backwards as well. I imagine watching a movie like Bo is Afraid today, if you if you did like that movie, I actually don't think you have to do too much legwork or watch too many films to sit down and watch Possession and no. mine a lot from that movie. And I think that's kind of cool. Is that is that DNA that's worked its way through cinema in the most unlikely way, but it's still around. We're still getting movies like Possession today. It's just they're handled differently. They're maybe yeah. a little bit more reined in on certain things. I, I would kind say of. also a little bit on the nose because yeah. I feel like the audience nowadays, the meat you have to give them is... Hey, we need a 45 minute backstory about this yeah. character to show that they had trauma before this. So their trauma dealing with this movie can relate yeah. to how they deal with trauma because the audience has a lot of trauma. We all have trauma. That's what I love about yeah. possession is it just goes in. We don't know their story. Yeah. We don't know their backstory. We just know that it's ugly and you can figure out about it. Like I, I just watched the killing for the first time, the 56 Kubrick movie. Yeah. And I love oh, it. Wow. I, I loved it because it's short and it's to the point. And it's like, it's if great. they made this now, They'd have a mediocre ass actor play these character actors, and they'd explain 45 minutes about their backstory. It's like, you see, I was a cop, and then I lost money. And I was like, no, this guy comes in. I don't even know this character actor who plays the cop. I'm just using him as a reference point. He's good. I know this yeah. guy from the three fucking minutes he's been on screen afterwards. I'm like, yeah, I know that guy. I probably yeah. talked to that guy before. <laughs> or the bartender's like, I know that man. I don't need to hear of it because I've seen that guy a million fucking times. I've had conversations with that guy. I know who these people are just because the character actors are that fucking good. Yeah. And that's what like, we're that, missing. Like, Killing's such a good movie, man. Yeah. Honestly, it, 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 like, it goes to show like just certain filmmakers are just like naturally great at the start. And Kubrick's a great example of that I, one. I would have... I'm surprised that one hasn't been remade. That to me feels like... I like, mean, it, it should... it's been lifted from a lot. Like seeing a that lot. Ultra, like Jackie Brown. The same fucking thing. Exactly. But it's three. Exactly. I love Jackie Brown, but it's like two and a half hours long. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I've just got to that point now. Like it's what I love Jackie Brown to death. But nowadays I'm yeah. like, I'm not watching your fucking three hour movie. Like, yeah, I, I, I'm done with the Marvel movies that are long. Your movies yes. doesn't justify that runtime. When it, when I was a kid, I put in a three hour movie. It was a bona fide five out of five. Yeah. Even even for a 10 year old kid, I was like, oh, Braveheart. This is going to be an excellent movie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, this is a long form movie. Yeah, like, this yeah, is going to be great. Yeah, like yeah. Goodfellas. This is going to be great. Yeah, now I'm like, yeah. this is going to be shit. Nobody <laughs> edits their fucking movies, man. That's this is editing. It's different streaming audience. I think editing. that's the thing. Streaming, I love streaming. Like, I think like like the, the ability to just be able to think, oh man, you know what? I really want to watch that movie and be able to purchase it on Amazon or whatever and then watch it there and then yeah. is, is, is a great gift we've been given. The flip side of that is allowed filmmakers the opportunity to make films far too long because the, the they're like well people will just hit pause in the middle of the movie or they'll watch half of it in one night and then watch the other half the other night and i'm like well, it's, no uh, no, <laughs> like, no like, like, i took like the irishman like one whole day to watch i love the movie but i was like i'm never watching it again uh, yeah yeah i'm the same i've only ever watched irishman once i by the time it finished i was like well like scorsese still got it no, I have no inclination of ever going to back, no. going back to watch that movie. Even these new movie, which I I saw in the cinema, I loved the uh, uh, Killers Kelly of the Moon. Yeah, Flower, Flower Moon. Moon yeah, yep, it's fucking incredible. 
I don't know when or if I will ever watch that movie again. It's so strange. I, like, there's just no time. There's just no. Yeah. It's like a one and done. I, I appreciate it for everything it is. I hope it wins loads of awards. I'll never watch it again. But talk Return of the Living Dead. I watched that four times in one week. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like, or like Day of the Dead. It's like yeah, put it on. Yeah. Even, this so, movie's I, long. This movie's yeah. long. But guess what? It's it doesn't t- two feel hours. Long. Yeah. It doesn't feel like, long. Yeah, like uh, there's there's more than one time that I've been like that hour and a half. I can watch pieces. Like, yeah, like, like yeah. I am like, getting no cinematic nourishment from pieces at all. Um, but it's it's on. I can do it. Like I can put it endlessly. I can laugh all the way through it. And yeah, and there, but there is that part of I like especially like movies like this. You feel like and there, I have to be in the right headspace. I have to be like it has to be a certain day before I can sit down and watch Possession. Yeah. Um, last night it was with two fingers of whiskey at about 10 o'clock at night when the family all went to bed I'm like right now come at me possession because um, the alternative was watching it this morning and I was like it doesn't feel like a first morning thing on a Saturday night. morning with toast sort of movie maybe <laughs> a Sunday morning rainy day after yeah. a hangover yes <laughs> after like, like one of your friends that you used to be best friends with in high school died of an OD that you haven't talked yeah. to in 20 years <laughs> yeah, we're, we're shoving on possession. We're like we're doing possession tonight. But, um, uh, yeah, it's a it's it's a, it, like I it's one of those ones and to kind of bring it back to kind of like a, a closing thought in on this one, it is a movie that is inherently difficult to recommend. Even though I think it's like a masterclass of acting performance, I think the cinematography is incredible. I love the composition. I I, I love so much about this movie. If someone asked me for a movie recommendation. Possession is going to be so far down on that list of movies that I would recommend purely because I kind of feel like you almost have to interrogate the person before you can recommend it. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like you have to ask yeah. like a standard 10 questions and if they answer yes to all those questions, then maybe you can say Possession. Um, but it's not easy. It's not easy to, well, to recommend at all. All the movies we compared it to are all the same kind of deal. It's like you'll... It, it's not... It, it, if somebody says, I hate Cemetery Man, I'm like, I get it. I love it. Yeah. I know yeah, why yeah. I love it. Uh, you, I hate Possession. I get it. I love it. I know why I love it. Yeah. Um, there's some movies that if somebody says they hate, I'm like, you're just being a dickhead. Or you're just... <laughs> but there's a well, lot of movies. That's not the answer. <laughs> yeah, I'm just like, but why? And then they have some dumb reason. Like, I just think that, like, zombies, like, his arm was loose in that one scene. It's terrible. Yeah, that's the reason the whole movie sucks. Yeah. Okay. You're just... <laughs> Like you had a predisposition to hate this, but no, like there's certain movies that you're like, yeah, I can't argue with that. I don't. It's not for everybody. Like, yeah, and so, but that's like, like, I'm I'm of the opinion that cinema isn't for everyone. I think that's no. like there's certain movies that clearly have a huge cross market appeal, and certain movies that play to a tiny, tiny audience. I think it's when people try and force a huge audience to watch a tiny audience movie that that's where a lot of the backlash comes yeah. from. Um, and that's not this movie. And I'm kind of glad that it's, it exists with a bigger interest base now, but it's taken, you know, what, 40 years to get there. <laughs> you know, it's, um, it's, it's a long slog. I, I knew that it had kind of reputation. When I initially saw this one, I got like a DVD. Uh, yeah. And I think it was with Shock. Mario Bava Shock. Wow. Um, so I put this in and I was like 12 or 13. I was like, it's a video nasty. It's going to be yeah. crazy. I made myself a fucking frozen pizza stuffed crust. I'm sitting there watching it. I'm like 20 minutes into this. I'm like, what the fuck is this? Like, yeah, I don't know what the, the fuck's way. going on. <laughs> this isn't a video nasty. I'm just like watching it because I saw like the images of them like laying on each other with the blood, stark blood. I was like, yeah. I just had no idea what was happening. I, I didn't finish it. I got like 30, 40 minutes into it. When the pizza was gone, I was like, I, I gotta go, movie. <laughs> but then as I got older, like as like you know, like eighteen, nineteen, I watched. I was like, oh wow, this is something special. And as I get, watch it more and more, it always gets better and better. But yeah, yeah, this is not uh, a, a first a novice movie. Like this. No, is, no, no, no. <laughs> there's like you know, like I'm talking about like there's people that are like, I don't read subtitle movies. I don't no. watch black and white movies. Then you're like, so you like Die Hard? You know what yeah. to talk to him about, right? Like <laughs> that Predator sure is good. I love that shit too, man. But I'm not gonna be like. Hey, maybe you should watch Tetsu of the Iron Man. Yeah, it's, it's, like, about, it's like Guess it, Who. It's like it's the, a, it's it's like a, the board game Guess yeah. Who. It's like that. You, know, like, like, you basically end up 
Right, no, like, I don't like black or oh, that one's down there. Like you're left with it like a like just a, a row of movies which have huge mass appeal, no depth at all. <laughs> yeah. are fun as shit to watch. Yeah. But like you like have have nothing. Like like, just, like they're made for like, like not cynical reasons, but they're made purely to entertain and that's it. You're, you're just like Chris Farley show. You're like, remember when he walks on the glass? You know what I mean? Like that's basically yeah. what you do. But I can do all, I love all types of movies, but yeah. You're like but there's certain things you got to kind of vary between people, you know, I, oh, and like, and I just, I know it's shitty, but I won't value certain people's opinions. If they're like, I don't watch black and white or sometimes like, I'm not going to argue with you about horror films because we're not on the same planet. Yeah. It's yeah. like, about, uh, yeah. if I can breathe on Mars and you can, I'm not going to argue that it's a livable climate. Yeah. You know, I think like, that's like, we, we get that, we get that conversation more and more nowadays as horror has more of a presence online i think there are people out there that want to fight their corner instead of just sitting back and saying it is okay for people to not like or like certain movies that's fine could you care less me? yeah I'm the, I'm the same i like i get to the like at the end of the year i sit down <laughs> i go back through what i've watched i make my little list i put it out there inevitably there's always someone that comes back to more about something and i'm like it's, it's fine my list Yes, yeah, like literally. Like, if it's not a group <laughs> pick here, like we're not arguing, yeah. it doesn't matter. None of this matters. It's my yeah, pick. It's not like how... a group pick here. Yeah, it's the, the, like and like it's supposed to be like your view and experience of a movie should be very personal to you. Yeah, and you shouldn't then try and impose those feelings on other people. A possession is a movie that is clearly made uh, almost selfishly for the director to to like air his feelings and emotions and everything on screen. I don't think for one second Zawoski would have been upset if no one liked this movie at the end. He needed to get out of his system. Um, it just so happens that it's really, really, really well done. And there's a lot of people that like, can watch it and appreciate it for what it is without fully understanding it. But I don't think for one second, either way, he would have, he would have been distraught if the movie had come out and no one ever watched it or no one ever liked it. I think it's just it's one of those things that has to be done. So. Just imagine, like, the producer, he's just like that. You ever see Don't Answer the Phone? Yes. <laughs> Do you remember that guy who he's trying to sell the pictures to, that fat guy with the guy? He's like, oh, these pictures are nice. He gets the, he gets possessed. He's like, what the fuck is this? I can't sell this picture. That's, like, that's the guy I imagine. Like, every time somebody turns in a movie like this, he's like, where are the tits? Yeah. <laughs> so kid, there must be, there must be, like, even, even in... Even in A twenty four land, there must be a pitch for a movie that comes in and they're like, eh. <laughs> like, 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 we, like, well, but we, we, we obviously don't make a lot of money as a studio, but we, we can't even begin to think of how we would do anything like this. There's <laughs> one old pervert in A twenty four is like, all right, now let's get that old person nude scene in there. <laughs> every movie he's like i think it, i think it's like i think they they've really understood that just people are very uncomfortable with old people being they're, naked. they're uncomfortable being old because they know that nobody's gonna want to fuck them yeah and nobody wants to not be unfuckable because <laughs> if everybody fucked old people and they thought it was hot everybody would be like can't wait to get old it's the a20 it's the a24 equivalent of a james wan jump scare <laughs> Works every time. Watch this. Have them eating out of the palm of my hand. <laughs> Wait. Hey, do you have that black cat jumping on the record? I got you, fam. We got something different. <laughs> different. What do you mean? The guy's just like, <laughs> <laughs> you know, cats can be scary. You ever see a yeah. pair of old balls? <laughs> yeah. There you go. Oh, that's scary. <laughs> like people have been talking about it for months. Just put over the commentary of that Adam Sandler comedy tape. <laughs> the old, remember that skit? I'm not going to go into that. But, uh, oh man. No, so, a couple oh. more things really quick that I've noticed about this, and I, I just want to get it off my chest. I would say mm. the movie The Untamed, which came out in 2016, yes. very much resembles Possession. Mm -hmm. And I would say that uh, the look of, um, uh, Isabella Johnny when she runs down the street with her arms clenched behind her with the sunglasses yeah. and that black coat. Um, so many Japanese films. Um, the anger reminds me of Hisiasu Sato. Like I feel mm. like characters be like that, almost like a, a Black Widow kind of like female character in movies. But also I feel like this movie shares some DNA uh, before and after with John Roland. Mm. 
Mm. Yes, 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 yes. Uh, R- Roland, and he's going through a little bit of a renaissance at the moment yeah. as well. With um, well deserved, in, yeah. And indicators putting out a lot of these stuff. Where I haven't picked any but, of it up yet. I want to. I have all of them on Blu-ray, so it's hard to be like, oh, I'm buying these 4Ks now. Yeah, it's, it's the thing about it is as well, as well like the movies in that that kind of the blurry format already look incredible. They do look and like even more incredible in 4K, but there is that kind of weighing things up <laughs> of. You know, do do I like it's looks I'm doing Living Dead Girl when it comes out. Gotta have yeah, that one on 4K. That's my favorite. <laughs> and probably Grapes of Death. And yeah. I might go for Fascination. Yeah. But but like, like, he's getting a, a little bit of a renaissance at the moment as well. But he like at this time period is you know, like especially in the in the eighties as well, is is churning out stuff which is visually and cinematically like it's so ahead of the the curve like in a visual style in terms of even how you look at possession in terms of its cinematography it's so ahead of the curve that people now are like are clamoring to try and make movies that have a visual style like this where this is just his visual style naturalistic lighting yeah but not drained of color plain only because it's naturalistic not ugly like yeah movies that are like yeah so it's supposed to be february what are we gonna do yeah i was turning this blue tint saturation on my shitty digital there we go look it's blue it's cold it's Excellent like it's like moment. when you watch the lightning it's why i like it's why i love like really um kind of early j-horror makey movies like yeah. you watch audition audition is i mean it's like audition could have been lighted by the same people here yeah. um all the especially Japanese the blue stuff tint like stuff 19 like 80 to like 9, 2002 I, yeah. it's hard to tell the year yeah because it all oh, yes. is lit kind oh, yeah, of the yeah, yeah. same yeah it's, it's, it's nuts but it's, it's hugely influential on the works so it's kind of yeah. amazing i love how they look honestly mm. that's probably one of my favorite things about the japanese ghost movies and the do-it-yourself shitty cheap ones direct to video from the guinea pig <laughs> movies all the way to like gozu like yeah I, I just like how they look even if they are cheap you know but yeah got a certain quality about it like i do this movie i think was influential i think it has a lot of pieces from other movies and it, it mm-hmm. went on to put pieces in other films too yeah yeah uh, as, as it's i mean like i say uh it's one of those ones where i don't know the next time i'll watch it as well um and, and maybe another six years down the road but i like i think enough of my life will have passed me by that the next time i watch it, i once again get gain another appreciation or have a, another additional feeling on top of the ones that i have already and accumulated over the years i've watched it so yeah like uh also we should mention the scene where uh <laughs> he goes to the mother afterwards yes. Yes, and she he's going to take her out, but she does it. That's so depressing. Yeah, that's I so sad. It's, it, yeah, it's, it's it's horrifically sad. And like, the movie has layers, like genuine layers. And like, there's a reason that she's dressed in black, and the room that she's lying in as well is is small and cold and sterile, and it, like the, like the ebbs so much, and it's so smartly constructed I, together. When that window blows open. Mm. And he lets it stay open. Do you think he's thinking that that's Heinrich's soul coming home? I hadn't even thought of that. So he doesn't close the window? Yeah, he doesn't either, no. Must I be. wouldn't either. Because I was like, yeah. why wouldn't you close it? And he's just like, let it be. Yeah. I don't know. Maybe because he's not really that type of guy. But at that point, he was. He was he, in that scene. Yeah, yeah. Because I don't think he's ever had someone treat him that way. Yeah. Yeah, Except which for- happens like like there's there's that thing is like and, and that's true to life as well as a character trait. You get people that are genuinely like aggressive or dickish or whatnot, and then they have that one interaction with that one person where it makes them feel something they're not used to feeling, and as a result, a little bit of that drops away, and you get another side of them, even if it's only for that one moment, even if it's only in that one interaction, and then they go back to being who they were before. But it's it's an honest thing. And, and as shitty as Henrik was, he's not nearly yeah. as shitty as uh, Sam Neill. And oh, no. what he does to Henrik is, is horrible, yeah. honestly. Because he, yeah. he he calls him for help because they're in the same boat. Yes. And he fucking, oh, horrible. And the way crushes that... Him. Absolutely that, crushes him. <laughs> that whole scene that he has, has shoots that, like how he gets on the motorcycle and drives mm. off and the crazy ladies dancing in the street. That whole yeah. scene is just the cinematography and the wonder is just brilliant. Yeah. And so, like, does it not make you think of, um, like, American Psycho when 
Patrick Bateman is like finally losing it and he's on the street and the cops are chasing after him and he gets his gun and he shoots a car and it explodes and he looks at the gun as if like it's a gun. <laughs> like it shouldn't have exploded. Well, it's the idea of just losing your sanity completely and how That's Cemetery how the, Man again. Yes, yes, it's how the uh, like the, your view of the world and your place there within. Like he becomes a hero. It becomes over the top and he's the hero of that scene in his mind. Um, and we see the anarchy. We also see the repercussions of it afterwards. Well, yeah. And, and then when he gets uh, attacked by the, the officers, mm -hmm. he's no longer heroic. No. The, the one scene is a bit comical when he says, drive uh, full blast into that, uh, <laughs> that kind of cab. He's like, sure thing. He doesn't even give a fuck. <laughs> that guy hated cops. That cabbie hated cops. He wanted to do it. He was like, why not? He's jumped out of the <laughs> and then he takes off running. That's a bit of comedy too. Like, it's weird because the movie is like no comedy, but there's yeah. a couple scenes that actually genuinely can be considered funny, I think. Yeah. Just how absurd and insane they are. I, I don't think they're unintentional either. No, no, no. I think, I think the. Henrik's kind of funny. I th but I think. <laughs> I, like, I, I've. I, I, horribly, I, I, I know that, like, there are certain circumstances where I know it's completely inappropriate to laugh that I laugh. Um, you know what I mean? And it happens, and it's I, it's an, I think it's a nervous thing. I think it's my body just doesn't know how to react in what would be a socially acceptable way in that scenario, so it just kicks into default laughter. I've also told the, the most inappropriate jokes at times when I've been given or overheard the worst news, <laughs> and it's just my way of like trying to do something. It's to the only way I can deal with it. You either yeah. laugh or you cry, you can pick. Yes. You know, that's just the way I think human nature is. That's why yeah. when people are like, you should laugh at those things. It's like, I know what I've been through. I'm going to laugh at the fuck what I want to laugh at. You yeah, don't like it. As, I don't care. Yeah, anymore. like, I, it's just the way I'm wired. Sorry. I can't function any other way. Yeah. I'm sorry. Mm. Uh, so when we're talking 1981 movies, I don't even know how to compare this to absolutely anything else. Like, like <laughs> I said, it's own genre, doesn't it? Really? <laughs> is there any other art films? Is Wolfen an art film? Is Looker an art film? Not really. No, not really. No, no. I mean, I guess No Mercy, No Future is the closest to an art film out of all these films. Yeah, I think I think when you when you're talking specifically in the in the realms of what this movie is doing. It's very, very, very difficult no. to compare anything to. Maybe There's uh, other movies that use kind of like um, that kind of dreamy, kind of weird, off kilter. People are like talking, behaving, or acting in, in other ways. But most of those are are foreign movies where they've been dubbed into like English language and something has been lost completely <laughs> in the translation. Like I, I, I most recently watched um, The Beyond, uh, which is this year, and you hear the characters talk, and I know that in the Italian it probably makes a little bit more sense and their interactions are probably... But when you see it dubbed, um, which I'll, I'll switch on to see every now and again, I'll do a little dubbing on instead of doing the original Italian with the subtitles, and it, it doesn't even remotely resemble what the dialogue's like, and as a result, it doesn't feel like real conversations. It's It'll not be too ready dissimilar to the conversations when here. It's ready. <laughs> That's <laughs> what you mean. <laughs> it kind of feels that way where you're like, "Am I watching like a a bizarre kind of Kafka -esque stage play?" I mean, it's just so so devoid of. But that's just the way it's translated through. So I could probably pick movies that have elements that remind me of this. But as movies go, there isn't anything like this in '81. Have you seen uh, Kismata, Kismapa, or whatever? Yes, 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 yes. That's similar because the high intensity family drama. They list that yeah. as a horror film, and I can see why. Uh, it's but about again, how, yeah, it's about how you feel when you watch the movie rather than yeah. I guess you'd it's, have to go with the drama over horror comparison. I would. I mean, I personally would class it that. But if someone came at me with a no, it's a horror movie, me, I would not argue with them at all. You know I, mean? I, I mean, I think Possession's a horror film, but I mean, it's comparisons are, are Kismata and No Mercy, No Future, which I think yeah. are more dramas than horror films. Yes. But so I, I, I guess it gets lumped in there, I think, because of the mostly to do with the creature stuff. Um, and that's I mean, you can do that. It's fine. Um, I, I consider I well, I would consider it very much a horror movie because uh, I think if 
I don't think it comfortably sits in drama. I don't think it comfortably sits in horror either. But horror becomes a weird tent well, for a lot of movies anyway. So it has a supernatural element too at the end. So does have a supernatural? Yeah, it's got a end of the world. It's got a lot of stuff going. I, I would say horror first for this, then drama. But the other two that I could compare it to this year, I would say, are drama, very much so over yeah. horror. But it's hard to it's hard to categorize shit. Right? <laughs> I, I noticed this year has been really terrible. Uh, going down letterbox and just like last year I, I watched a lot of semi ones that were horror but this yeah. time uh, this movies are listed as horror and i'm like why the fuck is the killing of angel street listed as horror on letterbox this is an australian yeah. fucking based on true story drama yeah it's just not a horror film this is a political thriller at best yeah i think we we've, we're kind of the the more time has went on the 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 boundaries of what can find certain movies of of blood so much so that genre, uh, uh, movies are almost genreless in a lot of respects now. Unless it is like you like you know if you're going to see the Boogeyman for example at a cinema, that's a horror movie. Yeah. Um, like you know, like there's no there's no getting around that that's a horror movie. But there are other movies where just the elements of the intention of what the filmmaker is trying to do or comparisons to other like th those elements that they bring in like for some reason instantly make them horror movies i don't always think they are but i think it's difficult not to be especially when you're like me and you're someone that watches a lot of cinema i watch like there's really yeah. no genre that's off limits to me um to what i watch but like my 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 favorite is horror and as a result of that i kind of see a lot of people trying to be the like the gatekeeper to what can be in and out and if I go too far in, I realise that my own arguments start to... So when people say, well, it wasn't scary. And I'm like, well, if I sit down and watch Frankenstein, now Frankenstein isn't a scary movie. Does that mean it's not a horror movie? It's like you can start picking apart those things. And I think it ultimately comes down to how it makes you feel. That's why I've kind yeah. of resigned myself to, if you think it's a horror movie and it scares you or upsets you or makes you feel anxious or whatever... That's fine. Didn't do it to me, so I'm not going to go that way. But if we didn't cool. vote, if we're not on committee here, it doesn't matter. Yeah, it will, this isn't exactly. a city council meeting where we all have to determine what's <laughs> or not. It doesn't fucking matter. We're not yeah. taking a vote on it. Yeah, I mean, I mean like, was sometimes... it, did you enjoy the movie? Was it a good movie first and foremost? <clears throat> it was. Then that's great. Like a lot of countries, what was that Greece documentary talking about genre film? They just say it's all genre, horror, yeah. sci-fi, fantasy, and film noir is all genre cinema. So yeah. essentially, it's all genre. They don't care. They don't break them up. No. It's, it's how they handle it. It's how they deal with it. It's how they contextualize it. Um, and some people like it and some people don't. And that's cool. That's fine. I mean, nobody cares. Like, at the end of the day. People yeah. barely care <laughs> yeah, about like, the... <laughs> you know, like, people don't care about literally, like, wars happening everywhere. Like, nuclear, like, war yeah. could be any day. And they're just like, well, you know what? Yeah. <laughs> I think Honey, I Shrunk the Kids is a horror movie because it's supernatural and scary. And that ant, he, and that, and like, when the ant dies and fights, it's like, that's yeah. a horror movie. I don't give a fuck, man. Yeah. <laughs> if I hear one of the same stale ass arguments again, I'm just gonna fucking blow up my computer. Yeah, yeah. it's it, like it's it's too much energy expelled on that, and not enough energy expelling on watching other movies. Uh, yeah. Just watch other movies. Stop it. Yeah, it's plenty stop out it. there. Yeah, stop, stop it. Stop it. <laughs> so, uh, what? Where would you rank this in in terms of 1981? Like top five, top three, top ten? So it's, it's an interesting one because to me, I think it's, it's definitely it's definitely top ten for me oh, for the no year. No doubt, a hundred percent. I even think on a certain in a certain mood, it would be top five for me, just because I am I'm attuned to. I like movies that that contain like very powerful performances, you know, like a weird abstract, like concepts and themes being grounded through emotion I, I love art house I, I, i'm unabashedly a, a fan of that so on, on a set depending on my mood i would definitely have it in my top five um but it's certainly in the top 10 for sure um because it's just as it's unlike anything else it's it was performed flawlessly um and it, it leaves me feeling something granted not wanting human contact for a while uh but it leaves me feeling something at the end which a lot of the movies from this year it's a weird year i think it's 81 is the year where it's trying to work at what the 80s are and it hasn't quite made up its mind what the a 80s lot of are. slashers because of friday the year before and yeah they're like it's kind of like is this our thing 
is this what we're doing? Like, <laughs> like are we doing this now? Um, and that's why when you swing into like '82, the, the, the that year feels like it's kind of started to work out what the '80s are, um, yeah. and it's leaning more into that. Um, and '82 like really kind of sets the stage for the next couple of years. This one is still it's like, and it's so many filmmakers like making their first attempts at doing things, or filmmakers kind of realizing that they're now in the wrong decade. Like Possession is a movie which I I don't even know if the director thought it felt like a horror movie when he was making it. It just yeah. felt like something he needed to do. Uh, but it's like it's such a cut above so much else on almost every level. Like yeah. like some of the best performances, some of the the like the, we talked about the cinematography, an amazing score. In, in terms of acting, there's no no movie that has better acting from this year. Because it, no it feels real. This is what I'm saying. Like you, we want to believe that there's something behind the scenes that that's happened here purely because of the performances you see. I, I do think there's some good performances. I think Susan Tyrell is one of the best of the year from yeah. Butcher Baker. Yeah. But I'm looking at this and there's just no other that stand up. David Naughton's great, but yeah. like nobody would ever tell you that anybody is doing a good job in Evil Dead. I mean, they're yeah. doing a fine job. But nothing special. Ironside, of course, is excellent. But Warbeck, Ironside. Katrina McCall are good. But nobody's yeah. like killing it. Yeah. Most of the acting is not exceptional from 1981. As good as a year it is. Yeah. I mean, stuff like Dead and Buried, the cast is top notch. Dark Knight of the Scarecrow, from top and bottom, all great, yeah. great, well acted. But a lot of the heavy hitters just have really mediocre to crap acting. Yeah, I think um, I think it's what kind of almost. You think about this year as well. So 1981 is... Um, you would think as well, like, this is the sort of movie that should transcend, like, the genre. A lot, like, the way we kind of talk about, like, it's almost, it feels like it's, it's in the horror genre, but it feels like it should be out with in contention for things like Oscars and whatnot. And it just so happens to be up against the year that uh, Scorsese's Raging Bull so, so you know I mean like De Niro got the Oscar in 81 I think um, for I know Bill. that best picture he that movie lost yes to, um, Ordinary People yes because but I'm sure I'm almost 100% sure De Niro got Oscar for best actor I, I would I wouldn't know yeah. I can't remember um, I know the Elephant Man lost too yes yes which is like with people that talk about, oh, yes, yeah, it's such a Lynchian movie. Elephant Man's this year, right? That was David Lynch's movie, right? And then fucking nothing like Elephant I, Man. I don't so. think this is Lynch at all. No, God, no, 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 no. Like, Lynch is not like Lynch doesn't deal with things like this. Like, Lynch is an observer, he's not a participant. Lynch's this movies make particip- less sense. Yes, but like, I think it's because he approaches, but I never get the feeling that. David Lynch tries to put any of himself in any of these movies. Like, you I know what I mean? I think it's all abstract. It's all abstract. There's no realism. That. Yes. There, there isn't, there isn't, uh, pure isn't it? This one here it's all is realism, all the director. It doesn't make any sense. Yeah, yeah it's all the director. <laughs> it's like, that. if you confuse those two things, you don't understand. I, I, you, I think you grossly misunderstand what David Lynch does in these movies. This is more Cronenberg than anything, but it's not 100%. even Cronenberg because it's, yeah. The acting's too good for early Cronenberg. Yes. Yeah, oh, yeah. Oh, God, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, God, yeah. <laughs> 100%. I love Cronenberg, um, but nobody's going to say anything about his male leads being very good until a certain time. Until, like, what, yeah, Jeremy well, Irons and Jeff Goldblum? Uh, yeah, well, Jeff Goldblum's and James probably Woods, the big one. And, yeah, 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 83. Well. I think 83 is when he was like, yeah, I need we, some we better had enough clout. <laughs> I had enough clout to actually get I mean, certain Oliver Reed I'm, killed it in 79, yeah. but he's not the lead. Yeah, he's not. He's not either. He's so fucking good, though. Um, <laughs> also, very drunk during the entire thing. Um, he acts better Oliver drunk. Performance. He's always better drunk. Always better drunk. Not true. Hundred <laughs> <laughs> no, percent no, no. not. Um, oh, he can act drunk because he's that good. It doesn't matter to him. Yeah, yeah. It's, I, it, it, you know, I don't need. I don't need a script. <laughs> Look at me. It's oh, like I was up all night drinking when I came in. And I memorized all my lines. Here's my dick. See that tattoo? Can I go, Mr. Reed? Yep. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> just someone someone asked. Just asked a, a, like a, do you know where the the the, 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 the sim guy is? And then like, he's running off and <laughs> I'm all Honestly, 
he always said shit that was like legit. He was like, he's like, why didn't you never uh, uh, go to theater or, or anything like that? Or why didn't you ever like uh, teach? He's like, those yeah. who teach don't act, don't do. Yeah. And I was just like, oh yeah. shit, he's right. Like, this you spend funny. your time teaching acting. What the fuck? Is you? No, you got to act. This fuck. Yeah, this yeah, guy's like, this guy's nah. cutting. He's highly intelligent. Right <laughs> I mean, that's the curse with a lot of highly intelligent people is self-destructive because they're fucking see the world for what it is sometimes. They yes. see a lot of darkness there. They see the world for what it is. They see a lot of darkness and they have great difficulty finding people that see it the same way that they do. A very yeah. lonely thing. A very, very lonely thing. Well, what's that Lisa Simpson joke? When she thinks she's going to get dumb, she looks out the window and sees Ralph open yeah. up the mailbox and put it down. It's like, eh, it doesn't seem like such a bad existence. He's like, ah, oh, ah, oh. <laughs> and like, we all know that like, just can you imagine never being depressed your whole life? Like people just going through life and being sure of everything. Some people do. Like some people go, like some people exist in this world without a care in the world. Like at all. Like nothing, like nothing phases them, nothing ruffles them at all. They are maybe never like truly a hundred percent happy, but they just don't. They don't let any negativity. Like that to me is weird. They, <laughs> like, they, they rush home from the coal mine and eat their yeah. uh, blue box mac and cheese and watch their shows. Yep, and that's that's rinse and repeat, rinse and repeat. Yeah. Maybe there's nobody like that. Maybe they just hide it better. Rega regardless, I don't. I don't know. Yeah. I don't care. <laughs> but uh, yeah. So like I said, it's it, this movie doesn't. There's not really anything to compare it to from this year. It kind of stands alone in its own thing, which makes it kind of very memorable. Mm -hmm. This is definitely a, a divide the audience kind of movie. I personally think it's a masterpiece. I think that people, if you don't like it the first time, give it another watch. Yeah. It's it's gorgeously made. It's superbly well acted. Um, Isabella Johnny as an actress have always seen it a few things of course Werner Herzog uh, Nosferatu uh, yeah. as well which is another movie I think could share some DNA to this yep definitely uh, she, yeah. she was on a bit of a roll there for a while because that's 79 isn't it yep yep so like she's come off that and then swinging through so whatever happened to her as an actress she just kind of acted in films here and there and then just kind of retired I think so I, but I think that happens with a lot of can a lot of European actresses, to be honest with you, I think a lot of them. Well, you see that with them, um, especially the the Italian like yeah, actresses yeah. who had that window of about ten years where they were just making loads, and then they just I don't know if they stop have families and you know decide that acting's like no longer. And which Fennec too? They get married, and then their husbands are like, "You don't got to act if you don't want to anymore." Like, yeah. and they go, "All right, fine." Uh, okay. <laughs> oh, do this shit anymore. So I think there's just a bit of that where acting wasn't always seen as like a full-time career. Um, and as a result, it just kind of... Plus, I also think there, there's a bit of that as well where like actresses nowadays have longer shelf lives oh, than yeah. they did in the past. I think For it was sure. a lot more brutal um, of uh, kind of you have this window to be able to that and then the roles that you want to do are just not there anymore and then you're typecast they talk about it nowadays and like you know like where like the 40 year olds playing grandmothers now uh, because that's just the way hollywood's made um i think it was even more brutal back then i think there was I a certain agree. thing that if you were like if you went over 30 at that point just there was no roles as as an interesting kind of powerful female presence on screen uh, just instantly just dropped away and then come back and see us in 20 years where we can cast you as grandmother or whatnot yeah and there, there's like a lot of it's uh, actors that ended up in italy that males that just worked until they eventually just committed suicide yeah yeah a hundred percent like luigi pastelli frank wolf uh the guy mickey knox watched jumped out of the window like it's just I, you always hear that like just a lot of suicides in acting yeah. in europe like in general I don't know. It's just very strange. Uh, as far as I'm trying to think of some actresses that kind of had a longer shelf life, uh, Sybil Danning, um, Dagmar Lassiter, she seemed to act a little, she's yes. a little bit older, but like, even if you think like Edwidge Fennick, I don't, I think she just kind of retired or sparingly did films and stuff like that. Very, so very, yeah. Very sparingly. And it's, it's, it's one of those things where you think about Laura how Gemsher. popular they were at the time. Like they were huge at the time. And yeah. you just assume that that would just continue on. And well, it did. I think Laura Gemshire also wanted to retire after her husband died. I think she was like, yeah. I'm out. Peace. I mean, I would have too. Like, if you're doing all these moves with your husband, it's fun. You're exciting. And then he's just dead. You're like, I don't want to do this anymore. I would have quit too. Yeah. 
I mean, there, there are there are a handful that uh, that buck the the trend. A lot of them are British, to be honest with you. Like in Britain, we cast people like as long as we could, and then they would go off and do theatre and come back. Yeah. Um, a great example of someone like that's Barbara Steele, who like oh, yeah. just was an absolute workhorse um, all the way right through, and never really had a shortage. Like when she when the roles started to dry up in the UK. Um, she went and did movies in Italy. <laughs> like, I was yeah. like, I'll just go do a couple over there and then come back. It's one of the reasons I love um, that Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, the Tarantino movie, um, is I think it captures that side perfectly. Like DiCaprio's character, it was a big deal. The role start to, to bring up. He goes away, does seven movies in Italy, all with posters and names that sound very similar to movies that probably did exist at the time. Yeah. And then he comes back and when he comes back, his stock's up. Um, because those movies were hits, well, like the drive through and whatnot, and they would come back and get something else. Well, that's what happened with uh, Charles Bronson. He was yes. uh, supporting in huge movies, uh, The Magnificent Seven, The Great Escape, uh, The Dirty Dozen, and he never mm -hmm. was a starring man until he went to uh, France and Europe and all those countries, and he did a couple of those thrillers, and then eventually he landed uh, Death Wish, and that yes. pushed him over to be the biggest actor in the world even though he yeah. wasn't the biggest american actor he was the most popular all around the world and bronson was a a, a force to be reckoned with too all those guys do that eastwood they he got famous over in italy yeah. so i mean like yeah it's and just ones that never truly got their potential are like um john saxon john yeah, saxon I mean, roles started drying up in america went away done a ton of genre stuff in europe and then came back and then all of a sudden he's in a uh, nightmare on elm street you know like he's like yeah. he's like right back in their mid 80s and he's got roles again but sometimes you need to go away um for people to realize how how interesting you are as an actor and you come back do another Henry's, like movies yeah. like that's there's nothing like that like they weren't getting cast in movies like that because movies like that weren't being made over here yeah so you get to yeah. see a different side of the performance. You're like, oh, we could cast him as that. And we never saw him like that because we were preconditioned because he was always typecast in a particular role. You never see them another way. And they come yeah, back with a, sure. like, like a, like a, like a, a mean style. streak. Yeah, a yeah. mean streak too. But uh, yeah, is there anything else you want to say about Possession or 1981? Do you have anything else going on you want to advertise? Um, so in terms of uh, podcast on the stairs is getting very close to winding down for the year. Um, it's been a weird year. Uh, half of the things I wanted to do, I didn't do. Um, just various things happened um, over here that kind of put a, a dampener on things. So I've been I've been trying to make my show as fun and quirky as possible by just doing things that I would never have generally done in the past or been putting off for a while. Um, I have uh, like basically 24 episodes coming out in December, one every day between the 1st and the 24th. Most of them are five minute reviewable segments of the movie Silent Night from 2012. So you know that's going to be hot garbage, but the guests are great. Um, and yeah, there's a couple of couple of interesting things in there. Next year, have no idea what I'm doing yet. Um, I suppose the big thing that's worth promoting is the one that I've spent the most time prepping for, and it's what I'm recording tomorrow. Uh, we are doing another director's conversation. We did one on William Friedkin, which is why I come on yep. and talked about cruising last time. This one is on Brian De Palma, and we are splitting it into two parts because he's got so many movies. Oh, yeah. um, so we're doing part one, which covers the years 1968 to 1980. So we are essentially closing out our part one with Dress to Kill. It's a um, classic. Which is a good way to close out because the movie he did before that is Home Movie, which is not a good movie. <laughs> so I've never seen Home Movie, and and oh, super, it's... his early stuff is real shit, like Wedding Party and High Mob. You're like, yeah, it's it's a guy. I think it's a guy who likes the idea of making movies, but does not have a clue on what a movie actually is and kind of doing the I'm surrounded by a lot of kind of interesting stage actors and all the rest and let's just try and capture that vibe on on camera and a lot of it does not hold it certainly uh like through the lens now of what his career would go and be like I I think it's weird like um Tarantino has a great opinion on De Palma um, that's worth checking out it's on it's a conversation with him on YouTube about it when he basically says that um, when Repulsion came out and uh, De Palma saw like De Palma had been looking at Hitchcock and all the rest and trying to like craft that thing and then he saw Repulsion and once he saw that he saw a different way of kind of combining the Hitchcock style of making movies and this kind of more modern edgier sort of feel and then the influence of 
of the kind of the jalo taken off and he somehow manages to wrap all three of those up and that basically explains the tear from the late 70s right through the 80s with yeah. him um and it really does if you start piecing it together sisters is long... a lot like repulsion a hundred percent yes same fucking movie and then yeah. dress to kill is just psycho it's just like what yeah. are we doing here he just, I, I love it. But if you get a chance, if you haven't ever watched it, the De Palma documentary that A24 did, which is just De Palma talking about his career, he is brutally honest <laughs> about everything. He's like, that, that yeah, I didn't like the, the reason none of my movies are great now. He's like, that Hitchcock didn't make a great movie after he turned 50. It's like, he made good movies, but he didn't make a great movie. Um, he's like, I'm the same. It's like, oh, like my career kind of, I still make movies, but I don't make great movies. You have that window. That window of that's so depressing. I, I, t- it totally is. There are directors that buck that trend for sure. We talked about Scorsese is a great example of that. Ridley Scott to an extent, and um, even George Miller. Uh, George Miller was in what he's in his seventies when he made that last Mad Max movie. Well, which is fucking huge. Um, so there are and, directors and, that buck that trend. Well, how old was uh, Romero when in day in day eighty five? He's got to be getting up there. He was born. In oh, it must have, must have been. He's probably like close. forty something, forty-two. It would have been his fault. I don't think he crossed the fifty mark. No. But like, <laughs> but there's also a part that I, I think that speaks a lot to De Palma. That's not a rule of thumb. That's De Palma acknowledging that he hasn't made a great movie after fifty, so no filmmaker makes a great good movie after fifty. Uh, Faulty, so, Faulty definitely did. Oh, 100, like, <laughs> but I think I think that's and that speaks to the guy. And then Bob once you understand that, that you understand the the the, the director mindset. a bit more. Yeah. I yeah. think once you once you get to that headspace of like, if it's not if everyone isn't like him and how he makes movies, then they're not making movies. <laughs> I mean, his movies are very cinematic, no doubt. They're Huge. actually movies. They're actually cinematic movies. A lot of people are making shit that's not. Like, like he literally he wasn't supposed to make the untouchables and then you look at that movie i can't imagine anyone else ever making the untouchables no. you know what i mean it's it's so it's so out I'd like it's so bizarre and they met people that you now see like basically like people will say that de palma is you know is, is using the hitchcock playbook and they met people that i now see that are using the de palma playbook and what they it, do the way it's they trajectory yeah. That's why when people are like, that movie ripped off that movie. It's like, they yeah. all ripped off each other. Of it, course they are. Like, <laughs> it's a moving fucking thing. It never stops. Like, unless you are like, like the first man to ever make a movie, um, you have seen another movie and it's inspired something. Uh, Either you, chose to do something or not do something. Are you that guy that fucking shot that train coming at the camera? No? Then shut up. <laughs> you know what I mean? I'm just kidding. Sometimes it's shameless. Bruno Mattei was just like dead clapping. He's like, <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes, <laughs> yeah, more. He's a Jack Nicholson, like. <laughs> but yeah, that's literally that. That's probably the one I want to publicize the most. The second part, which will cover, um, essentially everything he does from '81 blow through up. to 2019. I think was his last movie. It's blowout. Um, so yeah. Blowout, to blowout, which I mean, Blowout's my favorite De Palma movie, so I get to start with my favorite De Palma movie and close with. I think Domino was his last movie, and Domino was not good. Um, like even the part in Blowout that cracks me up is when John Lithgow was like, "I took care of that." He's like, "No, we never had this conversation." He's like, "No, oh, I took care of that." And he's just going, "I was like, no, I never said he's that." Like, I kind of, I kind of love that about like Lithgow and almost like if Lithgow shows up in a De Palma movie. He's a villain, uh, which I, I kind of love, but he's always like a, he's either like a villain that's like, it's a villain for always the best of intentions. Like all the way, like all, all these villains have like, if you root them down, they all have a reason why I like, I can kind of see why someone would go there. Um, his one bad. is like that, like people talk and if people t- like, you ask me to neutralize this. If I neutralize this, this looks sketchy as fuck. However, if I serial kill a lot of women and then this woman dies, She's just part of the serial killer thing. They're like, like, like it's like you said. They're like, we never told you to do that. It's all taken care of. <laughs> well, I mean, he's he's always great. Even I mean, I I prefer him as a villain. Like I saw him oh, as always. a kid as a villain. You know, like uh, I Cliff grew Hanger. up with him being a villain. Like Cliffhanger's the first my... thing I saw when he's got yeah. Like when he shows up in like that was the thing when people were because he did that that comedy show that Third uh, Rock Third Rock, Rock, Third Rock the Sun. And that, like, that, like, that just, like, has obviously imprinted well, things. Harry when he showed Henderson. up in, yeah, when, when he showed up in Dexter, and people were like, I've, n- I've never seen anything like that. I'm like, literally go through the 70s and 80s. 
that's John Lithgow. <laughs> that's yeah. like the run of movies there. Um, even at the early nineties, even Raising Kane, he's brilliant in Raising Kane. Yeah. I haven't seen all the Palmas like stuff he's in. I've seen Blowout, mm. of course, but I mean, like, I, I just watched Cliffhanger four million times because it came out when I was eight. It was the perfect time. Like, and I was yeah. just, I saw that movie. That's the first time I saw. It, I was like, maybe I saw Harry and the Hendersons as a kid. Yeah. And I saw him, and I was just like. This just always became a villain for me. So he's got. Uh, have you have you seen uh, Obsession before? No, no. Right. So Obsession's one that's worth checking out. Not not an incredible movie, and certainly wears its influences on its sleeve. But um, which, which Hitchcock movie is it this time? It's maybe it's maybe not even fully Hitchcock. If I'm honest, um, there's a bit I don't look now in there uh, for for sure, um, especially in the cinematography. But Lithgow. He's in the movie, so you know he's a villain. But he plays like a southern gentleman. Um, <laughs> it's, it's fucking great. He's he's the MVP of that movie many, many, many times over. So you will have a ball when you watch it. That uh, sounds great. I appreciate you doing this. Uh, I'll have to have Yo, you man. back for scanners and maybe get... Uh, d- like, d- like you will have to keep me dragged away from doing scanners. <laughs> See, I, like, I like scanners, but I'm not a, the biggest fan of it. That's why I'm trying to get the biggest fans of scanners. I, I you know, yeah, come on. I like, it's just a, it's a fascinating movie. I like, it's like on so many levels, it's a fascinating it's movie. Like, the, for sure. Yeah, like the choice of lead in that movie, you were mentioning earlier on about like Cronenberg really struggling to get leads. The choice in that, the, of the lead in that movie is in itself a scanners moment, like of a head explosion. You're like, you had like so much choice and this is where you went. <laughs> Even Art Hindle would have been better. Yeah, of course. Just get David Emge. He looks like the guy. He's better. Yeah. It's the fact that like your your villain in that movie is Ironside, and like you need someone who can stand up to Michael Ironside. <laughs> like, I mean, like I, me and my mom even like at age like tw- we're not going to talk about scanners yet, but yeah, this little preview. Me and my mom like I saw it when I was like twelve. Remember that yeah. DVD for MGM? I don't know if I saw it before. And we're watching this, and my mom's like, "I think I've seen this." And my mom's watching it, we're like. We like this, but that guy's terrible. Yeah, yeah. And like, and me and my mom were like, "Is it because he was out of society?" Even at ten, I was like, "Maybe they cast him because he's not good on purpose." Because yeah. he's and my mom's like, "Maybe, well, like, maybe that makes sense." But we don't know. <laughs> I, I like, think I think even David Cronenberg has kind of looked back on it as a missed opportunity. Um, so yeah, look, you get you get a bit of that, and if we can manage to wrangle in Mister Ransdell as well, you'll get a little bit of Bo's incredible scanners impressions. Um, which will add a, uh, add a little bit more color. Uh, Does he have a McGoonan? Oh, he has an impression of everyone. And the longer you know him, the more you realize that most of his impressions are terrible. Uh, <laughs> in Bo's head, they're spot on, but in real life, not so much. My dad was like that. Like I'd hear him talking on the phone and the, and like just talking to somebody. He'd be like, he's like doing an impression of somebody. He's like, so yeah. oh, that son of a bitch. Everyone was, oh. it's like, is that how they all sound? Oh, is that everybody's fucking voice? That's your impression of every single person. Uh, that son of a bitch! It's <laughs> like, not a person. Who is that? <laughs> so yeah, I, I, I'm looking forward to coming back and talking about that. But thanks for having me on to discuss no. possession, a movie like I say that I don't get. Like there aren't many people crying it to do a, a, a episode of possession. So. We talked a lot about it too. I feel like yeah. we actually there's enough to talk about. Sometimes 100%. you get a movie where you're like, yeah, so. uh and then he stabs that girl, and that we, we did. We did a, a fair few of them on our show when uh, we were covering some of those uh, like forgotten <laughs> Jolly movies. And it was like, like, if we can get fifteen minutes out of this one, we're doing well. Five minutes in the movie, ten minutes to make a fucking Dick Randall being cheap. Are <laughs> 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 making fun of the guy who the Humphrey Bogart impersonator? You're like, I still remember you're like, he has to stand that certain way with the coat like this, or he doesn't quite look as much. He doesn't like quite look like him. <laughs> like he physically like, has to stand like in a pose with one side facing the camera, <laughs> otherwise it all falls apart. It's, it's, like, it's absolutely incredible. It's like a guy who's not quite fat enough, but he looks kind of like Chris Farley, so he just walks around like <laughs> like his brother. Remember when his brother was trying to do his thing? And it's like, oh, I mean, yeah. it's kind of weird. He's like, yeah, holy kinda, shit. Like, <laughs> it doesn't work. It doesn't work. <laughs> Not quite right. All right. Well, I appreciate it. All right. I'll t- see you.